So today's session, Collective Impact for Community Economic Development, is brought to you by uh, the Canadian Community Economic Development Network. We're a national network of several hundred community organizations and individuals working to create local economic opportunities that support an inclusive and sustainable economy. Here you can see some of our members' logos. If you like the session today, consider joining us by becoming a member or signing up for our free e-newsletters. This webinar is part of a series. We've done past sessions on topics such as youth employment in the social economy, social return on investment, the resilience imperative, social impact bonds, and many others. All of these past sessions are on our website if you'd like to access them. I, my name, you can put a face to the voice there. I'm Mike Toy, going to be your host for the session today. And I'm very pleased to start off the webinar with a presentation by Liz Weaver that will last about 30 minutes. Then in the second half of the session, I will ask her the questions that you've posted in the chat box down at the bottom right. So once again, you should feel free to post those anytime, questions, comments. Uh, we'll collect them and uh, get back to them during the Q&A portion of the session. So before we uh, get into the presentation, just in the spirit of getting to know each other a bit better, we have two poll questions that you should see pop up on the screen here. The first one uh, inquires about your knowledge or experience with collective impact, if you're a novice or a seasoned collective impact practitioner. Uh, and the second question is whether or not there's a specific problem that you're hoping to address through collective impact. And you can type a short answer in there. So while you're filling those uh, polls out, I'll just do a brief intro for the session. We, we're very happy to have Liz here because increasingly community groups, public agencies, and governments are trying collaboration as a means to solve some of the most complex issues that they face but collaboration is not as uh, easy as it sounds. Paul Bourne, who's the founder and president of Tamarack, was also a driving force in the creation of SEDNET and a leader in the field of community economic development in its earlier days. And I think the way the focus of his work has evolved into community collaboration and engagement is very telling. Because as much as community economic development can be about the tools, the business model, some of the technical business aspects, uh, I think the real transformational or the foundation for that work uh, and the foundation for transform transformational change in a community often comes when all key stakeholders shift their practice to address a particular issue. And that's uh, real change. And Tamarack had already had a decade of success and learning with vibrant communities demonstrating effective place-based poverty reduction efforts when the term collective impact was coined in the US. And the similar similarity and characteristics was clear to me, and probably most people looking at it, that collective impact is an articulation of what Tamarack has been evolving for many years. So now there's a great deal of interest in the collective impact framework throughout North America and around the world. And I'm grateful to have Liz join us today from Alberta, where she's in the middle of a Western tour to take time out uh, for the, this webinar with us. So just before I introduce Liz, let's have a look at these poll results. We have uh, most people who are either a novice or have read some and want to learn more. Um, and a couple of people are actually using uh, imp uh, impact as a framework. So uh, that's, uh, that's a good basis. And uh, just a couple of answers in terms of if there's a specific problem they're hoping to address, oh, supporting transformational change in my organization and community, creating sustainable economic development in a rural community. So that's, uh, that's a, a good uh, couple of focus areas that we can use to refer to as we go through the webinar today. So thank you for that. Well, uh, let me introduce Liz Weaver. Liz is Vice President of Tamarack, an institute for community engagement, and leads the Vibrant Communities Canada team, providing coaching, leadership, and support to community partners and city leaders across Canada. She's delivered workshops on topics including collaborative governance, leadership, collective impact, and community innovation, influencing policy change, and social media for impact and engagement. Liz was also previously director of the Hamilton Roundtable on Poverty Reduction, and has held leadership positions with the YWCA Hamilton, Volunteer Hamilton, and Volunteer Canada. Thanks for joining us, Liz. You're very welcome, Mike. I'm happy to be with you guys. 
I'm happy to um, have so many people on the call today. I love, uh, you know, talking about collective impact. It's an area that I have a lot of um, uh, knowledge about and also a lot of passion because I'm really interested in how communities come together to change. So um, I'm going to just before I dive into the slides, just tell you a little bit about uh, Tamarack for those of you that don't know about us. Um, Tamarack is an institute for community engagement and Mike did a great job in um, giving you a good overview. We actually have three learning communities that we support. Um, one that's really focused at reducing or leading collaboratively. I mean, this is for people like yourself, practitioners who are really interested in uh, community change kind of efforts and you can see the web link there. The second one is around reducing poverty and that's and largely the work that I've been engaged with with Tamarack for the last number of years, so I think about seven years now. And then our final community, learning community, is for those who want to reconnect in terms of the vibrancy of their neighborhoods and the unique roles that citizens can play in social change. And so we have these online learning spaces which um, include the opportunity for practitioners like yourself to share you know, your knowledge and your expertise, and then um, we've also connected into a whole network of thought leaders, and Mike Toy is a thought leader for our Cities Reducing Poverty Learning Community. So we're not only looking internally to ourselves and to what's happening, you know, at Tamarack and with our partners, but we're also looking to a broader network of, of uh, individuals to really help advance ideas around community change. Um, what we're going to do today is we've done some introductions. We're going to talk about collective impact as situated within the idea of community change efforts. Um, I have some musings on how collective impact and CED might work together, and then there's an opportunity, as Mike said, for questions and reflections. Um, you know, uh, when we came to know about collective impact after the publishing of the article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review in the winter of 2011, you know, we've been following the work of the Aspen Roundtable on community change and citizen-led development and that kind of thing. And we see collective impact as uh, sitting within a whole number of spheres around community change. And community economic development is one of those spheres as well. And so um, as we think more and more about um, uh, collective impact, we think about it really within this broad um, kind of context, but there are lots of different ways that people are engaged in changing their communities. Collective impact is one of those um, mechanisms or one of those frameworks that really can influence how communities come together and work together. But there are lots of other ones, and not everything requires a collective impact approach. There are a couple of things that are important as contextual kind of items in terms of collective impact. One of these contexts is around collaboration, and what we've noticed as we've gone out to communities across Canada and in, in, internationally as well is that not everybody, when you say the word collaboration, not everybody thinks about it in the same way. And so there are a number of things that we think are collaboration on a spectrum, and you can see um, the spectrum, it goes, every, goes all the way from compete right through to integrating programs and services. What's interesting about this spectrum is as we start to move up the spectrum into coordinating our services and collaborating and integrating, you have to be much more intentional about building trustful activities, particularly if you're bringing people together from across a variety of sectors. Collective impact really does sit at the higher end of that spectrum in terms of cooperating, coordinating our activities, collaborating and integrating. So the spectrum, I think, is a really useful tool in terms of thinking about collaboration and how you might be involved or your table might be involved in collaboration. The next, I think, very important contextual piece, at least from Tamarack's perspective, is that really collective impact suits itself best when you're trying to deal with a complex community issue. When you're feeling like, you know, your organization or a variety of organizations in the community are trying to look not only at delivering programs and services, but really trying to move the needle on an issue that is complex um, and really vexing the community. And so here are some characteristics of complex community issues. They're often difficult to frame. So if you bring a number of different perspectives around something like community economic development, 
the business community might look at it in one way, the cooperative community might look at it in another way, um, citizens might look at it in another way, and it, all of those different framings actually help you really build this kind of perspective around um, community economic development. That's what we saw when I was doing the work in poverty as well. There are diverse stakeholders involved, each experience is unique. The other things are that we, you need to keep in mind, particularly around collective impact and complex problems, is that the characteristics and the dynamics of the issue evolve over time. And that really means that you have to take an approach that allows you to act, react, and adapt. So as your collaborative table is intervening in an issue like poverty or um, uh, community economic development, for example, um, the community will start to change, and so you've got to always be in tune with how the community is changing and always evolving um, the work that you're doing. So I'm now going to dive a little bit into collective impact, and we have a very short period of time to do this, so I'm going to go pretty fast, um, but it's really to give you a bit of a flavor of the framework and the elements of the framework so that you can um, think about it in the context of the work that you're doing. So, John Kenya would say, and John Kenya is one of the two authors of the first article that was written about collective impact that appeared in the winter in winter of 2011 in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. John Kenya is a managing director with FSG Social Impact Consultants, which is a nonprofit consulting firm in the United States, and the principal author, as I said. And he would say that collective impact is positive and consistent progress at scale. And so what that essentially means is that you're coming together around this collaborative table. You say we're going to really try to deal with this complex issue, let's say poverty, and we want to make sure that we are getting positive and consistent progress, that we are actually moving the needle on this issue of poverty, decreasing the number of people that are living in poverty in our communities at the scale of a community or at the scale of a neighborhood. So it's really about paying attention to that positive and consistent progress. Um, the reason why they first uh, wrote the article about collective impact, they were asked by foundations in the United States, large foundations, to look at the, what was the state of funding um, predominantly in the United States. And what they found largely was that it was a state of isolated impact, that the funders were selecting individual grantees, that organizations were working separately, and that actually Scaling only took place when one organization, often a large one, was um, dependent on a single organization focusing on scale. And while they saw that to be, you know, 90% of the picture that they saw, there were a couple of um, emerging examples where that was different. And the two examples that they cite in the initial paper are the Elizabeth River Project, where a whole community was trying to make a river that was taught to they were trying to bring it back to life. And the second example that they talk about is Strive in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, which is a whole community approach to educational achievement. And when they started to look at these two examples, they saw things like um, uh, funders actually being engaged in the project. They saw that it wasn't just one sector involved, but that there were cross-sector alignment, and that all these groups were working together towards the same goal, and they were really intentionally measuring the same things. And that, that you know, made them pause and say, huh, this is an interesting. And that actually started, they started to pull out what they saw from these examples and a couple of others and started to frame this work um, and call it collective impact, which we'll talk about um, in the next slide. Um, this next slide comes not from the work of FSG, but it comes from the work of the White House Council on Community Solutions. And the reason why I include this slide is I really like these five questions as a way of framing whether the work that you're trying to do, the work that the collaborative is trying to accomplish, whether it fits a collective impact approach or not. And there are a couple of questions, question one and question four, that really make collective impact different than the normal collaboration that we engage in. It's really about using data in a proactive way to both understand the problem, 
so that we can say, yes, we're going to move the needle on poverty by 10% or homelessness or economic inclusion, for example, and then to really measure our progress as we go. So, you know, those two are really connected. And then the other ones are that, you know, this, these complex problems actually take a longer-term investment of our time and our engagement from a cross-sector perspective. There are a number of phases to collective impact. The first phase is really about generating ideas and dialogue in the community. Depending on how cohesive your community is, that can take a short period of time or it can take a longer period of time. The next phase is really focusing on developing a plan for moving forward. The third phase is around really getting results, beginning to get results in your plan. And then the fourth phase is really to think about you know, how do we continue the sustained action and impact? At Tamarack, we very much have looked at collective impact as three to five year campaigns. And so you would think that you would go through all these phases in a three to five year period, and that would take you pretty much at phase one again, which is now how do we refine and deepen our approach in this work? And so it's, I think, a very helpful way of looking at it. Because sometimes we can be so daunted by the challenging issues that our communities are facing. Um, the John King and Mark Kramer talk about uh, three critical issues, uh, or sorry, three preconditions for collective impact. And they talk about this in, they talk about this in the first article that they wrote about collective impact. So these three preconditions are influential champions. You need to bring people to the table who actually have both influence and the ability to begin to scale change in your community. And so this is a really important precondition to think about. And at Tamarack, we've learned that it's not only the influential champion, but you want to engage their sphere of influence as well. A great example is if you're trying to get high school graduation rates to improve in your community, you want to not only bring in you know, the director of the Board of Education, but you want the, the high schools and the principals to be involved as well. The second precondition is urgency around the issue. And sometimes what we think is really important and urgent isn't necessarily on the tops of the minds of all the other people living in the community. And so this means that we have to actually do some of that generation of ideas, that early phase work, to really create some of that urgency. And then the final precondition is around making sure that there are enough resources in place to really do this work on a complex community issue. There are five core. Oh, sorry, Mike. Go sorry. ahead. I was just going to jump in here because uh, it's a tremendous amount of material that you're go are going through uh, pretty quickly because of our time limitation. I just wanted to remind everyone that if you do have questions about any of these slides that you see going back so quickly, feel free to post them up here in the chat box, and we'll capture them to be able to come back later. Liz, are are you by chance still on that hands free? I am. Would it be Do you want me to go into uh, just um, the headset? Yeah, if, the, if that was possible, that might improve the audio a little bit. Sure. Thank you. How's this? I think that's a bit better, yes. OK. OK, perfect. So I'll go from here. OK, so um, thanks, Mike, for that intervention. I sometimes don't take time to breathe, so you have to just kind of jump in. <laughs> You're doing a good job. It's great. Oh, good. So there are five core conditions that really drive collective impact. Um, the five conditions are a common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities. And those top three conditions are actually very much connected together, as we'll see in a minute. Um, the, third, the fourth condition is around continuous communications. And one of the things that you know, we've noticed, and I think the folks who are working in the collective impact, and I'm sure the two on the call who identified that they're working in this way, is that you, when you bring people from a diverse communities together, you've got to spend more time really being intentional about continuous communication, making sure that everybody is um, singing from the same songbook, and also knowing that you're making progress and that you're actually moving forward. And then the final um, condition of collective impact, and again, I think this is different than normal collaboration, is this idea that we are going to invest 
in a small backbone infrastructure that will really help move this forward. And that means, in many cases, hiring a couple of staff whose focus it is to really make sure that the Collective Impact Initiative is moving forward. That might not always be the case, and it might be only one staff or a part-time staff person, but having those resources um, to really steward the work is critical. So just to clarify, Liz, the, the previous slide was on the precondition. So that's what yes. you need before you would start. And these five is basically, is that like the process? This is how you would do collective impact and these are the focus areas? Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to go into all five of them in a bit more detail, Mike. Right. Um, but yeah, the preconditions, the preconditions are really critical. And they do tie into these five conditions. So if you think about one of the preconditions as adequate resources, it absolutely ties into having backbone support, right? right? So when you're engaging with funders and you say, you know, we think we want to use collective impact as an approach, what you want to do is say, and part of our thinking about that is that we know we're going to need some backbone infrastructure to move this forward. So are you as a funder willing to invest in that? And you know what's really exciting is that we're starting to see in Canada a number of funders really start to understand collective impact. The Ontario Trillium Foundation, for example, for those of you that are in, in Ontario, are looking to spend a portion of their annual funding on collective impact initiatives across the province of Ontario. And similarly in Quebec, you know, we've been really fortunate to have the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation not only support um, the work of Tamarack around poverty reduction, but they're also invested in food security and a number of other um, important funding areas. But we're seeing increasing interest both from funders and government in Canada around collective impact. Great. Yeah, let's look so at I think the case for backbone support will get easier and easier. Super. Okay, so now we're going to go into the five conditions in a little bit more detail just to give you some more background. So the first condition is around this common agenda. And here are some elements that are really integral to the common agenda, including a shared definition of the challenge to be addressed and the clear and shared goals. So not only do you want to say we're going to move the needle on poverty, for example, but we look at poverty as economic inclusion. And so the interventions that we're going to then be involved in are things like living wage campaigns. So you can see how the logic is built through a common agenda. But the, the folks around the collaborative table also want to focus on principles that will guide them to work together jointly. Some things to think about, some things to consider when building a common agenda are the prior history of you doing this work in the community or the people around the community doing this work, data, of course, the community context, and who's convening the um, collective impact work. You really do need to have a trusted leader to facilitate the collaborative efforts from the get-go. Those are really critical. Um, Mike, before we go on, is there anything that you um, think you, can, you want to add here around a common agenda? I just know that from my experience and what I'm familiar with uh, around members, this is, is absolutely uh, um, the fundamental starting point, right? We can all say that we have a shared vision or shared objectives, for example, for a community's development, but how we get there, uh, what strategies uh, work and how we are able to align or focus our and complement our activities is really that's the heart of the collaboration that we're talking about. So um, this, as you mentioned earlier, really depends on the cohesiveness of your community, how much time and how feasible this is. But it's absolutely the most, in my from my perspective, one of the most important uh, starting points. Yeah, and we've um, often used a theory of change approach. And part of the theory of change approach in building a common agenda is really some thinking together about what is the change that we're envisioning for our community. So here in High River, Alberta, that's what we're doing today and tomorrow is bringing people together to think together about, you know, what's the vision that they want for the well-being of High River. So it's quite a, quite a good process, but it says that um, you have to bring in some of those usual people that you work with work with, but also um, some of those other folks that you may not necessarily always work with to bring in really that diversity of ideas. 
The second condition of collective impact is around shared measurement. And this is really an opportunity to say, yes, we're going to work collectively on this, but we're going to be intentional about our results and we're going to measure our progress as we go. So it's about establishing a system for gathering and analyzing the measures and then also to make sense of them. And what we did at Tamarack with our vibrant communities is that we uh, joined together and developed a common evaluation framework and our communities reported every six months on the progress that they were making and that's really critical. And then we would look at the results and we would try to make sense of them together. There's some important things to think about in shared measurement. And so many of the collective impact efforts that you see in the United States, you'll see them wanting to move the needle on high school graduation rates or poverty numbers or homelessness numbers. And those are really good. They are population level outcomes. And that's essentially what we're trying to do, trying to move the needle on this big complex issue. But there are lots of other outcomes that we've um, seen in our work in vibrant communities, we, um, and we frame them into what we call the four Ps, right? So initially in collective impact efforts, getting the right people to the table, getting the diversity of sectors, you know, getting the issue on the community agenda, those are process outcomes, and we have a number of them here on our table. Next is the progress outcomes. Are we working differently? Are we starting to align our programs and services, and what does that look like? Um, are we getting some funding to help us do that? Those are progress outcomes, and they're important to identify and, and uh, measure. And then policy change outcomes. And I always like to say there are big P policy changes, and then there are small P policy changes. And big P's are when you're changing, you know, municipal government policy or provincial government policy or even federal government policy. But there's also one, there's also policy changes when organizations intentionally come together and say, you know, instead of having our folks go to multiple organizations, they're going to come to a single door, for example, for services, or organizations agree to share data. Those are small P policies. They're about working differently. And so it's really critical to measure those as well. And it's usually the progress, process, and policy measures that are your shorter term measures that actually show that you are making progress. If um, policy, if population level change takes a three to five year period, you want to be able to report early stage um, uh, progress along the way and these other measures really help you do that. Um, so I'm going to move on to the third condition of collective impact, which is mutually reinforcing activities. And so you can see how the top three are linked together. This idea of a common agenda that we all agree to, then we're going to measure our progress. And then the third thing is not to start uh, our work from ground zero, but really to say there's already a ton of stuff happening in our community. How do we begin to align these things in a mutually reinforcing way that will get us to those policy and progress and process and population level changes that we're envisioning and will actually move the needle on this big issue that we're trying to get to. So I often think about, you know, in a community there's already this wealth of, you know, businesses and organizations and individuals that are doing some really good work. Based communities, how can we not have them work in silos but actually start to bring them together, sometimes in a joined up way and sometimes sometimes in a complementary or a specialized way so that we can move the needle on this big issue. And, you know, um, the, in the last couple of days, we, I've been talking about collective impact a lot. And what I often have um, the groups do is draw their collective impact um, vision, right, and, and start to show how different partners can be involved in this bigger vision. It's a really great way of visualizing how mutually reinforcing activities can line up to get some really big traction on um, collective impact efforts. The fourth condition, which I talked about uh, earlier a little bit, is this idea of continuous communication. That again, it's about those uh, formal and informal ways of keeping people informed. It makes sure that you know you're recognizing that you have citizens with all sorts of skills and capacities, and so you want to have um, a system that's open and reflects the diversity of, of ways that people can get involved and can learn about your collective impact and 
initiative, and that it's also an opportunity to surface some of those tensions or those difficult issues. And, you know, one of the challenges, I'll give you an example, and it connects into community economic development. So we have um, a number of cities that are working on poverty reduction efforts across Canada, about 55 of them, and some of them are really advancing living wage as a key component of reducing the number of people living in poverty in those communities. But when you start to advance a living wage initiative, you have to look at your own collaborative table and say, well, who around our table is paying the living wage and what are some of the barriers for some of you folks to be paying a living wage? And often at these collaborative tables are municipal governments, not-for-profit organizations, sometimes small businesses. And so you've got to have that internal conversation first before you jump out on a living wage because you don't want to embarrass and um, the folks that are sitting around your collaborative table. And that's where, that's a really good example of how sometimes difficult issues have to be surfaced at the collaborative table and then also in the community in terms of um, really trying to advance this work. Good. Am I good, Mike? Yeah, that's good. And I think we're at the, the last condition for successful collective impact. Yeah, we are. We're coming to the end here. So the final condition is this idea of a backbone infrastructure. In the States, they have big money, so they call it an organization. In Canada, we're a little bit more modest. Um, but it's the group of um, staff and key volunteers that really are going to watch the collective impact effort and move it forward in a way that really makes a difference. And so you can see, you know, what the backbone infrastructure has to focus on. And it's really a lot like being the manager of a construction site, really making sure that all the players around the table are informed and are moving forward and actually that you're actually making progress on your common agenda, your shared measurement, and your mutually reinforcing activities. So those are the five conditions of collective impact and, and also the three preconditions. Um, and, you know, I was, I was thinking about collective impact and uh, community economic development, and when I thought about this, I went to your website, Mike, and uh, looked at, you know, what you're trying to do in terms of the big vision for community economic development, which is around creating vibrant, resilient, and sustainable local economies. And I put that in, and I thought, man, that that seems to align really nicely into, you know, what I consider to be some of the core elements of uh, collective impact. And so I was trying to match the two together. And I think that, you know, perhaps not everything that fits within community economic development would naturally lend itself to collective impact. But there might be some um, pieces of the work that you would say, huh, maybe it's an opportunity to, you know, either use collective impact as a framework framework for change in the communities that we're working with, or maybe community economic development, and we've seen this at Vibrant Communities Calgary where they've partnered with Momentum, maybe um, it's a partnership with a pre-existing collective impact initiative in a community where there seems to be alignment, right? The, um, the province of New Brunswick, I know they just went through some interesting elections there yesterday, but their uh, poverty reduction strategy is an economic and social inclusion strategy. And so it seems to me there's really nice potential alignment um, between the work of your partners, and there probably, it probably already exists, the work of your partners in uh, New Brunswick and the work of these collaborative community roundtables across 16 regions in New Brunswick. And so that really is kind of some of my early thinking about where um, potential alignment might um, might uh, situate itself. Yeah, that's very interesting. I would uh, agree entirely. I, when uh, one of the tenets as well of community economic development is an asset-based community development approach, and so when you're looking to mobilize a community to identify the opportunities they want to pursue for revitalization and draw on existing assets, so that engagement and common agenda um, has a lot of similarities with the, uh, the initial outreach. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so I, I've ahead. just brought up a slide. Um, I know we haven't had too many questions in reflections yet, so I thought I would prime the pump a little bit here and uh, ask you guys some questions and maybe have a little bit of reflection. So here are some questions that I came up with, but um, Mike, um, maybe I'll turn it over to you and, and you can lead off this next section. 
Sure. Um, so those are some suggested questions for you. We, we're now in the Q&A period, so uh, I'll invite people once again to type questions into the chat box. We see Emma's just posted an excellent question there. Uh, there was a lot of material covered in the presentation. Liz did, Liz did an astounding job of getting through what is a, a fascinating and very rich subject in uh, just over 20 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I've just unsynced the presentation, so participants should be able to scroll back through the slides. You can look at them yourselves. If there's some that went by too quickly, you can revisit and invite other people to uh, post your questions here, and we'll go ahead, and why don't we start with uh, with Emmett's question, Liz, if you've had a chance to look at that. How can collective impact be effectively applied in small, rural, and remote communities where services are in dire need and the number of service providers is limited? So I guess that's uh, uh, in small communities where you have a, a small number of service providers. People tend to do a lot of different things and a huge demand. Do you have some experience working in those kinds of contexts? Yeah, I mean, we have been watching that. Uh, we certainly, uh, uh, in our vibrant communities, have some smaller communities that are joining into the work as well. Sometimes you might want to look at it more from a regional perspective. Um, a tool that we often also bring into this collective impact work um, for small, rural, and remote communities is um, uh, one called the Communities Capital Framework. And um, it says that essentially the idea behind the Communities Capital Framework is that there are all sorts of different capitals in, uh, in every community. And it actually applies really nicely to smaller communities. It comes out of the United States, and it's, um, it's been developed across extension programs um, in South Dakota and, and some other communities. And I like it because, you know, sometimes in smaller communities we think we don't have as many resources as we do and, as other communities, and yet there are lots of capital that can be drawn on. And the nice thing about smaller communities is that there is you know, often uh, a more cohesive base from which to build, which is quite exciting. The other um, uh, place that we've looked in terms of rural and remote communities, and you can find some of this work both on the Vibrant Communities Canada website, but also on the Tamarack CCI website, is we had a webinar um, with some folks in uh, West Virginia that have worked together in community economic development across some really um, rural and remote communities. And they have a whole approach that they've used in terms of building the economic capacity of um, both uh, farmers across these rural and remote regions, but also people that produce cotton. And they have some pretty interesting stories. And I, I don't have the link to the webinar right away, but I, I um, Mike, maybe that's something that we can follow up and put on a link on your website as well to that webinar, and folks can access those, uh, not only listen to the webinar, but access those tools and resources as well. Super. Yeah, we can, uh, if you send that to me, Liz, afterwards, we'll send it to everyone in our follow-up email. For sure. Great. So lots of questions coming in here now. Um, Emmett had a second question in his uh, first post that we'll perhaps come back to. I want to move on to Doreen and Laura's question. What are some of the exercises or practices for engaging a core group in articulating or illustrating a theory of change? Yes. Sure. There's a great tool that's been developed by the Kellogg Foundation in the United States that they used um, around theory of change. They used it for their opportunity and priority use and youth engagement. Um, I really like it. And you, if you go to the Tamarack CCI website and you um, Google, it's amaraccci.ca, and you Google Collective Impact, you'll probably see this tool. It's a one-page tool that starts with the problem at the center, and then it looks at your community needs and assets. You begin to identify, you know, some of the outcomes that you're looking, um, that you're going to try to work on collectively. Um, what are some of the strategies? What are some of the assumptions that we have about this work? And then what are some leverage points that exist in our community? And this, this one page tool is a really great strategy for groups thinking together, and it actually flows very nicely with theory of change. Um, 
We also have some theory of change um, resources on uh, on our website. Um, there's a great resource by the NEKC Foundation in the US, U.S. called Imagine, Act, Believe, which really talks about theory of change. And it's a workbook, so it's a really great um, resource to also look at if you're interested in delving a little bit deeper into theory of change. Great. So, um, yeah, we posted a couple of links there in the chat box, and Doreen and Laura, if you aren't able to find some of those, especially the Annie Casey one workbook that uh, Liz just mentioned, follow up with us and we'll, uh, we'll track it down for you. Very interesting. Uh, John Gantz from SEDEC in Quebec asks, if there's a danger in an organization becoming, you gave the metaphor of the contractor, right, watching the carpenters and the plumbers yes. and the electricians go through, but is there a danger of the organization becoming too much like a construction company with many site coordinators, what happens when the backbone applies methods that are prescriptive rather than descriptive, and perhaps things get a little too chaotic? It sounds sounds like the heart of the question, and John, you can correct me here, it's really around the alignment. How are you yeah. able to align the, the practices or the interventions of the different groups to the common problem and the common solution. Yeah, and it can't, it's not about, um, that's a really good question, and thanks a lot, John, for raising it. It's not about business as usual in collective impact. So if you're engaging in collective impact because there's a particular agenda that your organization has, that is not collective impact. Collective impact is about the community agenda that is derived by having multiple stakeholders around the table. And the way to get stakeholders to leave the table quickly is to force your own agenda on this group. It's really about the group coming together in dialogue with one another to say, you know, yes, uh, economic inclusion is a problem in our community, and this is how we're going to collectively do it. Now, mutually reinforcing activities does acknowledge that, you know, different organizations might do things that help boost economic inclusion, right? So, you know, a business might say, okay, I'm going to hire low-income people. That's my contribution to this bigger agenda of economic inclusion. And the bank might say, well, we're going to, you know, think about how we're loaning to low-income people to you know, uh, purchase things and things like that. So there might be a whole number of strategies that um, are taken up by individuals, but they're all, those strategies are in service of this common agenda that we have all agreed to. So it, 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 it is a little bit of a different mindset in terms of the approach and working together um, uh, to really think about, okay, so how do we both um, leverage the work that we're already doing in our communities, but also how do we um, work on this bigger community agenda. Hmm. So that sounds like it's really almost the magic and perhaps a litmus test of the strength of the collaboration is how willing are the partners around the table, uh, how open are they to change, to shift their practices to in order to enhance the impact. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you've got to get there, you know, because um, I think if you think it's, you know, it, it's about the agenda that I'm trying to push, then that becomes a, that becomes a negative point for um, the other partners that are around the table. Mm. Mike, I just lost the Internet connection, so you're going to have to just follow up with the questions with me if that's okay. Sure, no problem. So um, our friends in the heart of Ontario, in central Ontario, at Sierra Community Ventures, asked uh, or described that in their rural community, collaboration is essential. They can't go it alone, uh, as is often the case. However, they tend to get resistance from local municipal government who see them as socialists, in quotation marks. Uh, breaking that image, building trust, has been a long and painful road, uh, but where they're constantly collaborating, opening, perhaps uh, being open to changing, but not getting much in return. Any advice or experience to uh, get through to perhaps reluctant municipal or other partner stakeholders? Yeah, I think it really is important to have those, in that early conversation phase, I, I talked about generating ideas and dialogue, you really do have to bring them into the table and ask them, you know, what are the problems or the challenges that you're facing from a municipal perspective and how does that fit into, you know, community well-being or uh, community economy building or whatever the issue is that you're trying to resolve, to really bring them into the table and to look at who are 
um, it might not be all of city council, but who are some of those allies, those early adopters that might be those influential champions that you might be able to at least bring into the conversation? And I think it is about then also being open to not solely holding the problem, right? Um, at, when I was the director of the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, we used to say we are all part of the problem of poverty. We need to all be part of the solution. And if you think about it, it's absolutely true, right? Organizations delivering services can be part of the problem of poverty because they might not be delivering those services in the community where it's most needed. The business community might both be part of the problem by not having opportunities um, for hiring folks that are, you know, living with low and limited income, or they could be part of the solution. So each of those is kind of the shadow side of each other. So to really, you know, to really think about who are the people that we need to have engaged. And we use this exercise at Tamarack called the Top 100 Partners. And it's not, it's, it's an intentional way of engaging, right? So to think about who are the top, if we want to move the needle on this, who are the top 100 people that should be involved in it? And then think through, okay, if we want the mayor involved, what's preventing him or her from being involved right now? And how would, what, what strategies would we have to put into place to bring that person to the table? That's very interesting, I think, focusing on the different strategies to engage particular key individuals. One of the ideas that I was thinking is whether or not outcomes, uh, focus saying, look, this approach has been demonstrated to work. It works in different situations, and we'd like to try it here. Is, was that enough to convince someone that they should be trying something new? I yeah, really I, I, that. I think that's a great suggestion, Mike. I think looking at other success stories, that's what we did, that's what we did in Hamilton, right? We said, look, at, there are other communities that are making progress on poverty. We can do it. We have the capacity. We have the network. We have the skills. And so we really, even though they hadn't been fully advanced in these other communities because we came in in the second wave, um, there, there are those examples out there. And then um, another strategy that we used in Hamilton is once we started to make a little bit of progress and other people started to pay attention to us, we would say things back to our city council because, frankly, we had a reluctant, even though the city was a co-convener of the poverty strategy, we had some reluctance from them. And then we would say, you know, look, other people are watching what we're doing. And so that was another way of engaging um, our, our counselors. And I think, you know, the other thing that I think is really important, particularly in collective impact, is to really think, you know, if you go back to the first slide that I showed about trust and turf on the collaboration spectrum, we really have to focus on how do we build trust particularly amongst the people that haven't necessarily participated at our table um, in the past. And how do we build those relationships? Rather than, you know, so often in collaborative work, we dive right into the agenda because we, you know, feel the pressure that we've only got people in the room for an hour and let's get it done, right? And, you know, um, people will leave the table because we haven't actually built a relationship with them. And I, and my the big lesson that I've learned in collective impact is that relationship, relationship building is key. Fascinating. And uh, just one last point, because we have a couple more questions and only about 10 minutes left. But um, as you mentioned earlier in Hamilton, once in the initial stages, showing some success, showing some wins, and feeding those back to those partners to say, you know, look, we are making progress. This is working. It's early stages. But uh, keeping people positive and demonstrating progress, as you described in the success measures, the four Ps is really, uh, I think, can help move things forward, too. Yeah, and it does, I mean, that's where having infrastructure is really important, right? Having a person who can collect some of that data or even figuring out if um, how you have your partners reporting on it, that's really critical, too. And, and then reporting all out back to everybody, look, you know, um, 
we said that we wanted to get the newspaper involved and look, they published an article or they published a series of articles. That's real success. And so often we, we do that work and we get those results, but then we don't tell anybody, you know, what it took to get to those results. And I think we do have to pay attention that there are lots of, and, and, and that's critical. So if you're thinking about what are your success measures in theory of change, you say, okay, we want to raise the profile of this, and then you get a series of articles printed in the newspaper, you've actually achieved what you set out as a success measure. Excellent. Um, we have a question here from Brent who asks uh, what, how collective impact can be used to develop open engagement in communities. And I just asked uh, um, overcome top-down engagement, so much more grassroots. Um, sort of bottom-up engagement and uh, agenda setting rather than uh, I think what John was hinting at earlier, which is one organization comes in and tends to dominate with their solutions. Do you have some practices or ideas about how collective impact can really foster an open culture of transparency and open engagement? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a really important mindset in collective impact work, you know, is to say that, you know, it is about the whole community coming together to try and resolve this issue or try to make traction on this issue or to get that progress at scale. Um, you know, so often we don't do that, right? So we get people sitting around a collaborative table and they come up with a plan and then it's seen as their plan. Right? And that is really uh, counterintuitive to what collective impact is about because the reality is, and we all know this, that you know, even in the work we were doing in Hamilton, 40 people will not solve poverty in the city of Hamilton when you have, you know, at the time when I started, um, 96,000 people living in poverty. It's impossible. Right? Those 40 people can work really hard. They're not going to get there. And so you have to really be intentional about you know, when you get your first ideas about uh, in the early stage discussion, generating ideas, you, you do that internally around your table, but then you face outward into the community and you say, community, we want your feedback in this and we want your engagement in this. And so every time, I always talk about it, that continuous communication as being about reinforcing loops in the community, really trying to get you know, the community engaged in it and the community thinking, because there are a lot of very creative solutions that are already happening in every community across Canada. So how do we get them engaged and lever those solutions to move, it, move the work forward? But also part of that is then not taking credit for it at the collaborative table, right, but giving the credit away. Um, a couple of months ago, we were doing a work for a workshop for backbone leaders, and someone asked the question, "Do you keep credit or do you give it away?" And one of my things, having worked in this kind of framework for a number of years, and and now watched as it evolves across Canada, the U.S., and Australia, you give all the credit away, right? Because it is about that community coming forward with their um, their ideas and their knowledge and their skills and really wanting to help move this e needle forward and that's I think a critical it's a critical change in mindset um, and that's hard it's hard when you're funded to do something because you you know our typical mindset is we're funded to do something and then we got to get credit for it because you know the, that's what the funders are going to be looking for that we actually achieved what we said we were going to achieve and I think collective impact and this is part of the work that we do at Tamarack is also about talking to funders um, to say that this is a different way of working together and so they've got to start to think about how they're going to be funding differently and um, there are some emerging tools and resources um, about, you know, talking to funders. There was a recent publication um, that came out of the Stanford Social Innovation Review called Collective Insights for Collective Impact. Um, you can find it on the website um, collectiveimpactforum.org. Um, and there's an article in there by uh, a woman who is uh, the executive director of GEO Partners, which is um, uh, kind of a collaborative of funders across the United States and Canada, and she talks to funders in this article about funders ha having f 
having to change funder mindsets as well. Well, that's a perfect um, segue, actually, Liz, into this last question from Martha, who was asking about uh, uh, funders and the relationship. And her question was, presumably, and we just have a couple, two minutes left here, but sure. presumably funders need to be involved directly and agree among themselves to a common agenda and shared measures. Uh, do you have any tips for how to get government funders in particular on the same page? You mentioned yeah, the Trillium I, Foundation. I, I, I think it is about those conversations, right? So it is about saying, you know, how can you be engaged and what are some of the barriers that are going to prevent you from being engaged? And so people can disclose at the table about how that how they can be engaged, not only um, from a physical perspective, but also from a funding perspective, right? And I think, you know, collective impact, where it works really well in Canada is that when there isn't only just one funder involved, right? When you have multiple funders at the table, each um, uh, contributing a little bit to the overall work. Um, at, uh, at, in Hamilton, we had business um, funders each kick in some money. We had uh, United Way. We had the Community Foundation. We had the municipal government. So it wasn't that one single funder had to bear the burden. Everybody shared it, and they agreed that this was an important thing to do. And so that's, uh, that's also a great way to um, have sustainability over the longer term as well. Fabulous. Well, we're just about out of time. I think we covered um, most of the questions here. I'm going to rethink the presentation for everyone. And we have a couple of slides there with some additional resources. Liz has a fascinating blog. We can hear about her uh, insights from New Zealand and the United States and the UK and traveling the world with uh, collective impact. But there's, of course, a ton of uh, articles on the Tamarack's different learning communities. Um, you can see those three learning community sites there, the Stanford Social Innovation Review original articles, FSG consultants who are one of the, the leaders or the originators of the approach, and of course the Collective Impact Forum, which is a community of practice sprung up specifically around this, uh, this approach. A couple more um, resources. Tamarack's organizing a Collective Impact Summit in Toronto just the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, and you can find out more uh, by following the link there. Uh, making cl Collective Impact work. Is that a, a, a written resource that you have, Liz? Uh, making Collective Impact work. Anyways, we'll follow the link. and uh, I think and it's, it might even be a webinar. Oh, yes, you're right. It's an audio seminar that, has, uh, that was presented earlier. And so the recording is there. That's uh, excellent. And Paul yeah. speaking with John Kenya, in fact. Yes. Yeah. So the two of the key leaders in the field, nonprofit management, collective impact, uh, some Stanford Social Innovation Review articles as well, and another example from the even the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, getting into collective action for community development. Yeah, there's um, a great uh, resource site in the U.S. called Living Cities. Uh, I think it's livingcities.org that you guys also might want to look at because they they're interesting. They have an interesting lens on collective impact as creating communities ready for investment that I think is uh, aligns really nicely with your work as well. Excellent. Of course, um, if people want to stay more, you can always uh, check out the SEDNET website for other learning events and opportunities and sign up for our free email newsletters. Everyone registered for the session should have just received an email with a link to a one-minute evaluation survey. It really is short. If you don't mind just uh, filling that out quickly, your feedback is very important to us. And of course, many thanks once again to Liz for sharing her unique perspective and tons of resources. A, a very a remarkable job for a, an important topic in uh, just a few minutes, but uh, there's lots more resources to, for people to follow up. And thanks to everyone on the, uh, in the session for your questions and your participation. We'll be posting the webinar recording and the slides on our website shortly, and we'll send you the link as soon as it's available. Thanks again, Liz. Take care, everyone. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your great questions.